Okay, I'll start off. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dudi Cohen from DryNet. This is Larry from Acton. We're going to talk about congestion management, congestion control or congestion avoidance in large AI GPU clusters. Uh, if you were here in the last uh, session uh, with Meta, some of the content is similar and built up on top of what they talked about with regards to DSF and DDC, so it's a good uh, follow-up. Um, so along the, the event, we talk about networking as a possible um, problem uh, issuer or, or bottleneck in an AI cluster. Specifically, when you build a large AI cluster, GPU cluster, for training purposes, you might uh, have your GPUs waiting for networking resources and standing idle, and this is not something you want to do. The, the, main, uh, the main motivation that we see when we come to resolve or to plan our networking architecture is to maximize the, maximize the utilization of the GPUs. You want the GPUs to work as hard as they can. You don't want any idle cycles on the GPUs, especially not caused by a lack of networking re resources. And, and those networking resources could be problematic because of different uh, measurement or different ca characteristics of the network pattern of AI cluster. This could lead to packet drop, to out of order delivery, to, to jitter, and these all are causing the, the GPU to be underutilized and to stand idle. So what are the solutions for this? If we look at specifically at congestion as a cause to all the trouble networking can cause, there are two main methods of resolving this. There are two main methods of dealing with congestion. One has to do with avoiding the congestion altogether, and the other has to do with mitigating the congestion. The first is the DDC approach. This distributed disaggregated chassis. As mentioned, one implementation of it is DSF that was mentioned in the meta session just right now. This is basically taking the entire architecture of the top of rack and end of row switching and turn it into a single network entity that acts like a very large chassis, but it's still distributed in a sense that it has different switches. The traffic towards the NICs is plain Ethernet, there is no special requirement from the NIC for additional processing. But the traffic in the fabric is a cell-based architecture, as mentioned, developed by Broadcom with the DNX architecture. And this cell base basically takes any ingress packet, cuts it into evenly uh, sized cells, and sprays the cells evenly across the entire fabric. Thus, together with VOQs and, and ground-based mechanism, ensures there is no uh, uh, congestion or there is no packet drop within uh, the fabric. So this is a way to avoid congestion. The other methodology is congestion control via the end devices. So the endpoints, uh, in, in the case of a GPU cluster, those are the NICs, and the NICs are spraying the packets across the fabric from the end device time. Uh, from the end device. This is another uh, approach that is taken by different industry uh, measures like UEC, the Ultra Internet Consortium, the, the first profile of UEC is taking this approach and there are also other proprietary solutions that take the endpoint approach. The, the, those two approaches come to resolve the main challenges that come with the nature of the flow of uh, traffic between the GPUs, and predominantly this is a low entropy uh, environment. And, and when we have low entropy networking, we start to see bottlenecks, we start, start to see elephant flows, et cetera, et cetera. Those are large size flow that take the same path across the fabric and causes head of flight blocking, causes congestion, causes packet drop, et cetera, et cetera. All this combined with the high bandwidth requirement of uh, collectives like all to all and even all reduce makes the congestion a major problem. And what we did together with Acton in the Acton lab is try to simulate the two approaches, the congestion avoidance of DDC of the scheduled fabric and the congestion management or mitigation of the endpoint scheduling uh, um, and, and try to come up with uh, a rule of thumb of where to, when to use what 
or what use cases are suited for DDC, what use cases are suited for the endpoint scheduling. And Larry we will describe the, the test bed and the results we got. All right, well, thank you, Dodi. So uh, before I jump into the uh, test beds and do all that, uh, let me just uh, also take a few seconds and talk about why are we actually doing this, this lab experiment, all right? I mean, this conference you can hear there are a lot of hyperscalers that's already doing a lot of them. They can afford, you know, they can afford to deploy a thousand GPUs and all that and scale it all the way out. Why are we doing it in a little lab environment? There are two motives from doing that. One is actually related to the call for actions at the very end of it. Number one, we've heard from not every customer, unless you are a hyperscaler or unless you are a startup that has a VC that pump a billion dollars into, uh, into your pocket. Not everyone that's interested in learning these kind of things can afford to have an environment. The community, OCP, and all that, if you look around today, talk about a lot of projects, a lot of uh, good consortiums and initiatives, talk about a lot of the advancement in technologies, but the actual lack of a place for hands-on for customers that cannot afford to pump in that much money at the beginning, but they're curious. They want to know in data center, they want to scale out. So they need a place in order for them to, um, to experiment and run some experiment. We all learn as we go into these kind of test beds. We'll start small here. We've actually have bigger test beds, but uh, for the, in the interest of time, we only have a few minutes. So what I did today is just kind of share a, uh, a, some snapshots of what we did, we are doing. The intent is this is the foundation of building out community testing. This is what really Edge Core's intention is. So in this case, what I'm showing you is just a very simple um, I'm sharing today, um, a simple topologies with simple leave and spine clause topologies. Right off the bat, the decision point, what that we have to make is, are we really going to invest and put all these AI servers? All right, that's a decision point number one. Or are we going to go with the different alternatives that go with emulators, test, testers? So um, obviously there are pros and cons on all of, all of that. The cost is a factor, time to market and then be able to bring out all these results is a factor. Also, it's not just about driving the workload to emulate and, and pump it through the network to look at congestion management. It's also about, if you don't have it, think about collecting the results, all kinds of tuning knobs that you have to tune to learn, the, to, get, to get that experience. And so with a tester, um, we think that it actually, a lot of these are built in reporting and, and do all of that, a repetitive script driving it to change parameters to, uh, to do repetitive uh, measurements. So because of that, um, what we have done up to this point is to uh, team up with Spirant. Is there any Spirant people in the room? Hey, as a shout out to Spirant. Um, they very nicely partner with uh, DriveNet and Edge Core, and that we are already forming three companies. We need more companies to come in here and, and do this together. Um, we decided to use their uh, solution, which is very nice. Um, you can see from the highlight. Um, I'm not going to go through that, but it covers everything from the speed uh, of the devices to your basic uh, rocky uh, congestion management features um, to the different type of uh, workload that they have. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an end-to-end -end, uh, tester that is very nice, one of the few that, in my opinion, is it's, uh, one of the few nicest uh, in the market. There are others. Um, in the spirit of OCP, there are others. Some of them are actually on the floor. Go and, uh, go and experience it. So we partner with them and, uh, and do some of the work. So um, first up is to show you a little bit of the endpoint schedule. What I'm showing here is the, really the fundamental things. If you want to start talking about endpoint scheduled and all of that, you always start with the dynamic load balance mode, right? In our test bed, we use Tomahawk 5. This is the, the state of the art, highest end um, XGS by Broadcom um, chips, and, and it's an edge core switch that we have. Um, we use the edge core distribution of Sonic um, to drive this. And uh, also, uh, we use the Spiron and connect it directly to the static route. 
and uh, therefore eliminating the need to do layer two communication. Simplified all of these so many variables, you try to keep it simple to start so that you can learn the effect of what happened when I apply DLB. Uh, Tomahawk 5 has different modes of DLB modes, so that's one of the interests that we first start and jump in and say, let's try to understand what it really means uh, to, to us. And then, of course, uh, you, you want to experience uh, priority flow control and then, of course, the, uh, the ECN and these kind of things. So I'm picking out, there's so many results I can pick out, so I'm just giving you one scenario in which how we study these things go, going out. First off is the, um, the KPI or the metrics that we use. Um, there's, no, there's no argument in here. The first step that you have to do is drive the workload through and then measure your job time, job completion time, the JCT. That is the, the, uh, the most uh, important. So focus uh, the, uh, the, the, the graph on, on JCT. The bus bandwidth, or also known as network bandwidth or good put, I mean, there's all kinds of terminologies with that. Uh, that's just the inverse of that. So the result is consistent. So for this pitch, let's just focus on the JCT. What we did here is we established the baseline. ECMP is the baseline. Without any uh, congestion control, um, you just run this through, and uh, this is the light green line. It established the baseline, the worst case scenario of the um, of the, uh, the workload that you are driving through it. And then from there, we try to exper experiment with the, uh, the other uh, common uh, control of, uh, uh, and also uh, provided by, um, by, by Tomahawk 5, uh, which is the, uh, the spray, packet spray. So you go from the other that extreme and trying to load balance at a packet level. The problem with, uh, you can see that it actually brings in a better performance, of course, than, than just a pure ECMB or Tomahawk 5 called it uh, fixed mode. With the uh, spray mode, uh, it has better performance, but one of the problems with spray is the uh, packet ordering, because um, it randomly spray it out to the uh, links. Um, so just because it goes out to the multiple links, it doesn't mean they arrive in the same order. So there's an order uh, uh, problem. This is all well documented. Um, and uh, so Tomahawk 5 has this things called eligible mode, which is the best of both worlds. Um, there's actually another terminology called Flowlet. Um, it's interesting, all these technologies, every name, there's an equipment name that you're gonna have to keep track of remembering uh, what they're called. But in any case, um, that is the best of both worlds. So you consistently see, at least in this little, little experiment, that the, um, the uh, flow let is actually makes a difference, okay? Uh, the other dimension, of course, is to look at uh, PFC versus uh, ECN. And then, of course, we do the other combo, which is the base of uh, uh, this thing's called um, uh, uh, DCQEN, so whatever that, that thing is called. Uh, so it's a basically a combination of uh, uh, PFC and ECN with uh, additional tuning knobs. So we try to run it through all of that and then see what happened. The workload is small enough. The topology is small enough. ECN does not make a difference. In fact, uh, it may actually make it worse. Um, the threshold kicks in too early. So what we did in the next slide is to dive into the ECN tuning because ECN itself has a bunch of tuning knobs, the basic three parameters. So we need to understand what uh, they are about. So within ECN, there are three uh, primary uh, uh, parameters. The uh, thresholds, the buffer threshold or Q-link thresholds, the minimum and maximum, and then the uh, Pmax, the uh, probability, marking probability. What it does is uh, it looks at the measure, the Q, until it reaches the minimum threshold, and that's when you start marking the packets to declare it as uh, congestions um, uh, uh, poss possible. So um, therefore, those packets will be treated differently. And then the probability linearly go up and, and these packets marking as the buffer continue to fill up and up until the maximum threshold points, which is the second parameter. And then um, how fast it goes up on, on marking these, uh, uh, how frequent does it actually mark these packets depends on the maximum uh, 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 marking probability. The higher it is, the higher it goes up, the uh, rapidly goes up. 
Nobody use, all the literature will tell you, use a lower percentage. Um, don't use too high a percentage, okay? Um, and rightfully so. And, but in this case, you look at what we do. Three parameters, how am I gonna show it to you on tuning it into uh, two, uh, two graphs or multiple graphs? And then if I show three graphs, uh, we're running out of uh, real estate on the slide uh, or running out of time. So what we did here is we tuned the minimum uh, buffer and using just 200K, very standard, the, the small one. And then maximum, uh, we reach, reach it up and trying to increase the buffer size uh, while fixing a certain probability. And we choose 100% probability. That's a kind of like the outlier extreme case. Nobody, nobody uh, uh, really use it at that high. But when you lower the probability, we are seeing actually the same kind of trend in which uh, the, as the buffer size increase, uh, the, uh, the, the KPI actually uh, get worse. So the optimal uh, in this particular experiment, by the way, don't again, do not worry about the actual number. This is just showing you if you are starting it, if you're starting doing these kind of things, uh, where do you begin? How do you find so many parameters? You don't know which one of them should you tune and which one of them uh, should you not tune. Um, where do you start? And so what we do here is we start this and, uh, and just do the, uh, the, the, the parameters and fix it at, um, at uh, 200K as the min minimum buffer thresholds and then 5 mac as the uh, maximum thresholds. And then we look at the marking probability and look at the results of, of the training. All of these are, are results and, and reporting and actually Spirant uh, test tools, actually the, their solution actually uh, report, uh, uh, have much better reporting than what we have. So uh, enough on the, uh, on the end point, let's jump into the um, fabric schedule. Okay, so the fabric schedule setup is actually very similar in terms of the physical layout. You still have the top of rack and then of uh, line, et cetera, but the difference is that everything, all the switches in this setup are the same Ethernet entity. So it's a large chassis that is di distributed across the data center. We use, as mentioned, the DriveNet's uh, network operating system, the uh, Broadcom DNX family, the Jericho 3 and Ramon 3. We, we have been using Jericho 2 and Ramon 1 in the field already, and this is the first implementation of Jericho 3. And uh, the rest of the setup and tests are basically the same. Now, what's interesting to see are the results compared to the Tomahawk architecture. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we see that basically in terms of job completion time, we have very good results with in, on, on the left part uh, uh, with regards to the scheduled fabric. When you compare it to the Tomahawk endpoint scheduling architecture, you see that in a fixed architecture, there is a significant difference because it is uh, underperforming. Tomahawk is underperforming because of everything we mentioned earlier. But if you do all the work that Larry mentioned and fine tune the Tomahawk or architecture or the, or the endpoint scheduling architecture, you can get very close to the performance, at least at this small scale, at larger scales, it's, it's a bit harder to fine tune, but at these small scales, you can get very close to the performance of the uh, uh, fabric scheduling. The main difference is the amount of effort you need to put into fine tuning and you know, twisting the knobs of this architecture. This is the same as with InfiniBand, if any of you uh, experience fine tuning InfiniBand. So this leads us to the question, when do we use what? Because the, the scheduled fabric is very simple. It takes no fine tuning uh, and, and performs well. And the Tomahawk architecture is very uh, simple to implement, but needs a lot of fine tuning. So Larry will sum up and say, when do we, that when do we use what? Right, so again, our objective here for this pitch is not to tell you which one, which approach is better. That's not the case. It all depends on a lot of things. So what we're trying to do here, nonetheless, is trying to leave you with some guidelines. First off, define your workload. Are you running a similar type of jobs through your fabrics every single time or more or less? Or are you a uh, GPU as a service type cloud service operator where you have multi-tenancy? So I know my time is up, give me 30 seconds. I don't have anybody that's come in behind me, right? So that's <laughs> my beauty about this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just teasing you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have multi-tenancy type of environment where the, job, the jobs that's running in your fabrics changes, fluctuated a lot, 
Um, we think that the uh, fabric schedule is probably a, a better approach at this point because it doesn't require a lot of tunings. Um, the other part, of course, is the latency, whether it is more sensitive, the workload that is more sensitive. You're running training or inference. What kind of jobs are you running? That is also important. Uh, the cooperation, on the other hand, between the uh, server or the GPUs and the network side, um, it's make it possible um, to do a lot of work. I, however, with the, with the endpoint tuning, however, what it does is it uh, actually uh, uh, would then take uh, resources away from your uh, compute stack. Is that something that you want to do? So a lot of these are your decision point. It is too early. Um, so call to actions, it's really quick, a few call to actions. I already outlined that the community needs a place for people who want to experiment these kind of things to learn how to tune, um, especially on the endpoint side, um, to come in and, and work with it. Uh, we love to have uh, this kind of interrupt test lab. OCP used to have it for the old timers. Uh, but last couple of years, I don't see them anymore, um, except during the event. So uh, cross-company comp collaboration is also needed. Um, not to mention, again, on the uh, Fabric side, uh, the Sonic community has VOQ in there for a long time, but it's been stuck in the last four years. I just gave the feedback to the community yesterday. Um, you want to advance Sonic, it is a widely deployed uh, 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 NOS in the data center. This is something that Sonic needs to pick up. So that's a summary. Thank you. Thank you.